Welcome to Authors on the Air. I'm Reese Hirsch, and I'm interviewing author James Grappando about his exciting new thriller, Code Six. So um, I'll provide a little bio about Jim for a second before we get started. Uh, uh, James is the winner of the Harper Lee Prize and a New York Times bestselling author of 30 suspense novels, including the uh, Jack Switek series. And his novels have been translated into 28 languages. He's also a practicing attorney specializing in entertainment law and intellectual property law. And he is an adjunct professor of law and literature at the University of Miami School of Law. So welcome, James. And uh, it's pretty, I, pretty uh, evident I can't hold a job, I guess, right? There's <laughs> a lot of things going on there. <laughs> Right. Yeah. As we were saying before we uh, signed on, you know, I, I'm also a practicing attorney. And the fact that you managed to write 30 novels while practicing law is, is an impressive feat. You know, definitely it's not an easy a, task. Yeah, it's been a long run. You know, I, I, I started writing long before there was such a thing as flex time or, you know, now since COVID, everybody's working remotely or almost everybody, at least part of their day seems to be working remotely. And I didn't have that advantage back, you know, when I started writing was the, you know, the late eighties, early nineties and FaceTime in the office was critical. So my writing time was pretty much limited to, you know, eight o'clock at night to maybe midnight um, was really the only time of day I could write. So, you know, it was a big sacrifice to put together a, that first novel, The Pardon came out in 1994. Um, and then it's been kind of a novel a year ever since. Well, that, that's uh, very impressive. And uh, my first one came out in 2010, but uh, after I'd sort of come up the ranks and made partner. But but uh, you know, congratulations on the release of Code 6. And uh, it's, a, it's a great thriller. And it also raises some interesting questions about big data. Uh, what inspired you to write this novel? So, so it is about big data, but it's really more specifically about data mining. Um, right. And, you know, probably a lot of your your listeners have heard the old adage, you know, that that's sort of a joke, but not really a joke in, in big tech and big data is that, you know, if the product is free, you are the product. Um, and um, I, I've, I've kind of found that that mantra kind of intriguing uh, and eerily true. Um, right. And, and to the extent that um, you, you know, we so willingly now, um, especially um, younger generations, so willingly give up their personal information. Um, and, uh, and, and we do it in ways that we don't even realize. It may be obvious when we like something, right, that we're probably communicating something about our preferences. But, you know, algorithms can now pick up how long you simply pause when you're scrolling through and surfing um, on your phone. And so all, and you know, the, 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 the face rec recognition data that's collected, the voice recognition data that's collected, all of these things um, lead to um, kind of an Orwellian, you know, 1984 kind of existence um, in the virtual world that is impacting um, not only how we, uh, w w you know, our and our lives today, but I'm thinking about, and what really drove me with, to write Code Six was, what is going to happen to the generation for whom all of this data has been collected since they were 12 years old, um, and what will be the implications of that when, for example, the president of the United States um, has a trail of data going back to when he or she was 12 years old and what kind of insights might um, foreign powers or, or, or powerful um, corporate influences have over uh, when they have that kind of information and data on a human being. We don't know the answer to that yet, right? I mean, we're all sort of still, you know, all of us of that age, 40s, 50s, 60s, well, you know, our data has only been collected since we were adults. Um, but we're not far from a situation where um, decision makers and politicians and people of influence in government and, and the private sector um, will be 
um, part of that generation for whom their entire life has a digital footprint. And the, and the company that's at the heart of Code 6, uh, Buck Technologies, they're, uh, you know, all companies collect big data, large companies to some degree or another, but, but this is a kind of company that's really at the heart of a lot of the most sophisticated uses of data mining that even the government turns to them for purposes of, you know, assisting in counterterrorism activities. You know, it, it sounded a little to me like uh, the company Palantir. I don't know if that uh, if you had that in mind a little bit with with that company. No question about it. I mean, I think that's that's, a, that's an astute observation on your part. And there are companies like you know, like a Palantir who have now been able to expand their not just their defense contracting ability, but they were you know they they they're part of the private sector as well. You know, they're not like you know it used to be that only companies like Raytheon and so forth would get the defense contract. Uh, tr contracts, but now you have companies like Palantir who have sort of that hybrid kind of existence between the private sector and defense contracting, and um, and it, it it's it's been a game changer in terms of that industry. But I think it's also a game changer in terms of accountability um, and um, w w what limits there may be on com or lack of limits <laughs> there may be on on that co a company like that's access to not only sifting through our data through the private sector, but what are they gaining and who knows, you know, that's one of the fun things I get to do is that as a, as a fiction writer rather than a nonfiction writer is that I get to speculate about what they might be getting through their government contracts, not through just through the United States government, but through any foreign government and not just foreign governments, but maybe some unfriendly governments as well. You just don't know. And that makes uh, for a, a very um, uh, ripe and fertile ground for a thriller writer to explore the what if uh, possibilities. Right. And, and you have a protagonist that's a playwright who is writing a play that sort of goes back to some of the origins of big data. So you get a little bit of a, in, in a page turning thriller, you also get a little bit of a history lesson about how big data evolved. And uh, in particular, I was wondering, um, if you were able to draw on your own theatrical experience in, in, with that you know, playwright protagonist. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, writing a play was not something I ever considered doing, but I, I do practice a fair amount of entertainment law um, and I represent Broadway producers. And I've um, um, and as a result of, of that sort of law work, I got my first peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, and a local um, director down here in South Florida asked me to write a play. Um, I did not um, think that that was really w within my wheelhouse, but Joe Adler was his name. And Joe um, is legendary here in South Florida, had uh, asked me to write um, a play about the world's first personal information catastrophe. Um, and in my view, the world's first personal information catastrophe is the Nazis use of IBM technology to identify who is Jewish. Um, you know, we've all heard this, you know, we've all read Anne Frank, you know, and we know the stories of neighbor informing on neighbor and there, there is truth to that. But if you get into the real history records of this, what you'll find is that the way the Nazis were able to identify who was Jewish was by using the IBM, old IBM punch card technology uh, electromechanical pre-computer technology um, to process census data. Um, and this is how, for example, people who didn't even know they were Jewish ended up in concentration camps because somewhere in the survey of 80 million um, Germans, someone in the family may have mentioned, oh yeah, you know, uh, I think Grandma Shana might have been Jewish. Um, you know, and maybe not everyone in the family and the, the entire family even knew that, but the Nazis knew it. Um, and obviously it had catastrophic consequences. So I wrote a play called Watson, um, which the fun thing is, is now uh, that became Kate's play in Code 6. So Kate is writing a play about the Nazis use of IBM technology. She also happens to be the daughter of my fictional CEO of Buck Technologies. So she's kind of writing a historical play informed by what she sort of learned at the dinner table all her life as the daughter of the CEO of Buck Technologies. Um, 
And as part of her research, she not only learns what the Nazis were doing, but she learns some scary things of what um, Buck Technologies, her father's company may have been doing. And that's where the story takes off is you have that intersection of, of past abuses of big data, present abuses of big data, and of course, the, the old warning of history repeats itself. So big data was scary, even in its earliest days. And um, do you think that uh, you might ever see Watson uh, produced on the stage? Or is, is this its lone appearance in, in this in this book? So we've uh, Watson actually did make its world premiere down here in South Florida. At Red Day. We had 35 performances um, sold out here in South Florida. Uh, my timing could not have been worse. Uh, it was the last play produced in South Florida before the um, pandemic hit and shut down every theater, right? So we're hoping that it'll get picked up again. In fact, um, one of the fun things about Code 6 is that it's a play within a novel, and that in itself is not unique. I mean, I've read novels, uh, you know, like Ian McEwan's Atonement has a play within a novel. But one of the things I've always been frustrated about when I've read stories about a play within a novel or a movie within a novel is that you can't ever actually see the play or see the movie because it's, it doesn't really exist, right? In Code 6, the play Watson, Kate Gamble's play, my fictional playwright, actually exists. And we've released Watson simultaneously in print with Code 6. So readers who are really interested in that historical angle of the Nazis use of IBM technology can enjoy code six and then go back and download um, Watson to see what Kate was up to when she was writing her play. Oh, that's great. And where do they find Watson? Is it uh, available through your website or? Watson, you could go to my website, jamesgrappando.com, or it's, it is available directly in paperback or um, ebook on amazon.com. Okay, great. Well, um, you uh, sort of toggle back and forth between uh, series characters and standalones. Um, what do you like about writing standalones like Code 6? And is Code 6 a standalone? Do you think you might go back to these characters at some point? See, that's a, that's a great question, you know, because I, even though I have one series, and that is the Jack Switek series, and Jack is a Miami criminal defense lawyer who started out his career defending death row inmates. But, you know, I ne that was... The Pardon was the first Jack Switek novel, but I never intended that to be a series. Uh, it wasn't until I wrote five or six standalones that I decided to go back to Jack. So yeah, it's possible I could go back to Kate Gamble because in a lot of ways, it's she's similar to Jack. Jack was in his 20s in The Pardon. He was a young, ideal, you know, idealistic lawyer um, and people wanted to hear more. So I suppose someday I could go back to Kate. Um, what I like most though about you know, even if this ends up being nothing but a one-off, um, I really do like to stretch myself as a writer. Um, and Code 6 was get, definitely getting out of my comfort zone, and you know, at least three ways. You know, one, it's a, it's a woman protagonist, right? For a man to write a woman protagonist, fortunately, I have a, 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 a terrific woman editor, um, uh, and she's, I, I, and I also had that for 25 years before Carolyn Marino retired, but I have a, a young woman who uh, took her place, who's just very insightful and helps me flesh out the female characters, which is important because, you know, 80% of fiction is actually read by women. Um, so, so that's critical. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, I, I haven't heard anybody call Code Six a legal thriller <laughs> yet. You know, there's I think one there might be one or two characters uh, who are lawyers in there, but it, it is a tech thriller um, and kind of a historical thriller to the extent Watson is incorporated into it. Um, so that was a stretch, um, you know, and and, um, and and it was it was also a stretch just in terms of the amount of research. Um, and I like the research. And the hardest part about the research is deciding what to drop on the cutting room floor, right? Because you can get carried away. 
Um, I'm sure you right. find that in your in your own uh, writing, you know. And right, you you want to use all the fascinating stuff, but sometimes yeah. the reader isn't quite as fascinated as you are. That's exactly that. right. And so you so that is the hardest part about a, a, a thoroughly researched book. And I and I would say Code Six is probably the, the most thoroughly researched book that I've penned um, in, in at least a decade. Um, and a lot of it has to do with you know, the, the, the historical component of it that went into Watson and then the today's component, because as you know, in the cyber field, I mean, you know, anything more than two years old is, is kind of obsolete, right? You know, so you've got to just, you've got to not only, and it takes a year to write a book, you know, so, so I found myself not only researching things, but constantly having to update the research to make sure that when the book comes out, it's not old news. Yeah, in a way, whenever you write a technology thriller, it's it's a kind of historical fiction because almost as soon as you write it, the technology has moved on you know, yeah. to the, the next thing. But, but the fear uh, hasn't, the fear doesn't move on, right? I mean, it's right. like it's the same. It's just that it just seems to get more expansive. The concern gets to be more expansive and um, and more pervasive and and faster. Uh, you know, things that we thought, oh, in ten years this will happen. All of a sudden, it, the time is like um you know five years and then it's like oh no it's actually going to be here in 18 months uh, and that's that is a, a very compelling part of of code six well uh with that i mean this has been fascinating but i think we uh, we reached the end of our session here uh would you like to provide a little information on uh, where readers can find you your website social media that sort of thing yeah i completely rebuilt my website so i'm very excited about it i hope people will check it out uh, it's James Grapondo, my full name, dot com. Um, I'm on Facebook um, on my author page. Um, and I love conversing with my readers online. So it's not just a static page. Um, you know, let's chat. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time for the interview. And uh, it's a great read. And uh, I, I recommend it highly. So thanks very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right.